home. But, uh, everything yeah, so, Luca, thank you very much for um, willing to talk to us and uh, over to you. So thank you very <clears throat> thank you very much, Tom, uh, David, and uh, hello to everyone. I hope people can hear me. Yes. Hello. Can yes. can everyone can everyone hear me? If you uh, yes. Okay, that's good. Yes. Okay. So uh, yes. Good evening yeah. to everyone. It is a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, to uh, talk to you about the development of a Jewish community in Italy. And uh, um, in fact, uh, as, um, as Tom said, I will talk about the development of the Jewish community in Italy. I will also um, discuss the origin of Italian Jewish surnames because this is something which I'm asked quite often. I will also reply to those, uh, uh, to the people who have posted their uh, questions until Friday evening. Uh, on their uh, families coming from Italy. And also I will show you uh, what are for me the best books, most of them in Italian, when it comes to, uh, especially to researching your uh, Sephardic ancestry in Jew, but also when it comes to, in general, the, to research uh, any um, Italian Jews uh, in the past, in the different towns in Italy. Uh, we have a lot of census data which are not known, not exploited and so on. So let's, uh, I'm myself, I, I'm, I live in Luxembourg since 30 years, but I'm uh, Italian. I come from uh, Ancona um, and uh, uh, I have uh, also um, a degree in Jewish history from the University of London. And uh, I also recently uh, acquired, uh, as many others, the Spanish nationality via this uh, Sephardic Spanish law. So let's start. Um, we, um, when it comes to uh, the, the development of the Jewish community in Italy, uh, one must remember that uh, Italy has been a country only for the last 150 years. Before, before 1861, it was not a country. It was divided into many different uh, uh, duchies, grand duchies, republic, and each with its own laws and its own attitude towards the, the Jews. Uh, and this was actually a situation which was to a certain extent beneficial for the Jews, because when they became uh, under severe legal or economic pressure in one part of the country, they could move to another part. And uh, we had also some historical periods, not only when uh, Jews were expelled, but also when different uh, uh, states in Italy could were, were also competing for attracting Jews where uh, the local ruler thought that the economic benefit of the Jew was more important than uh, uh, religious consideration or the pressure of the church and also the pressure, the constant pressure from uh, coming from the Spanish and Portuguese uh, kings or queens. So the sentence, the history of the Jews in Italy would therefore be incorrect because it can apply only from 1861 onwards. onwards. And it would be more correct to say the history of the Jews uh, uh, in Italy, more the Jews of Italy. Um, as I said, uh, expulsion uh, took place, but uh, like, like in England, in France, in Spain. But uh, as I said, uh, when expelled, they could move from one part of the country to the other uh, instead of going abroad. Although many of them did go abroad, especially in the Ottoman Empire during the 15th and 16th century. So, um, and it was, you know, some, it was somehow more convenient for them also to, to, to move to uh, a place which was near and more familiar to them in terms of culture, language, climate, and so on. The story of the Jews in Italy, I would like to say it's very long and uh, it is quite fascinating. Uh, they were all, all, all um, they were mostly very few in numbers throughout history, something like between 20,000 and, uh, and 60,000. But they live here in Italy for an uninterrupted period of uh, uh, almost 21 centuries, longer than any uh, European country with the exception maybe of, uh, of Greece. And uh, they have participated very much to the cultural, economical and political life of, of the nation. Uh, Italian Jews were always between 0.0 five and 0.1% of the total population in Italy. 
but uh, you know they they account for 25% of the Nobel Prize won by Italians uh, at the moment in which they were expelled uh, from university because of the racial laws in 1938. They accounted for 10% of university professors. So let's say they were punching uh, much above their, weight, their demographic weight when it came to, when it came to um, economics, culture, and so on. It all started at the time of the Roman Empire. Uh, Jews, uh, already in Roman times, Jews were documented uh, in Rome, as well as in other parts of the, of the empire. Uh, but the first uh, sizable uh, contingent of Jews seem to have arrived as slaves after the invasion of Israel by Pompeo in around uh, 60 um, uh, BC. And uh, Julius Caesar actually shortly afterward, they, uh, he granted to them the freedom to perform their religion. Uh, and, but their number, however, uh, seems to have been increased, increased a lot under Augustus. Uh, a lot of them after that came, uh, of course, uh, during the Jewish uh, struggle in Judea against the Romans. And uh, this resulted in a great number of Jewish slaves being brought uh, by the Romans to, to Italy. Um, many in Rome, but even more so in the region of Apulia. And uh, um, they were soon they were freed and they, they acquired their freedom and many decided to uh, stay in Italy afterwards. And most of the you know, following emperors, they demonstrated some sort of benevolent attitudes towards them. And with Caracalla, they also got the Roman citizenship, which was given to all the citizens of the, of the empire. So during the first uh, uh, century of the empire, it is estimated that there were around uh, a few uh, tens of thousands of uh, Jews. Uh, most of, half of them were actually, um, it is estimated, living in Rome, and the other half in the south of, of Italy. And these trends continue also for the, uh, the, the last centuries of the empire. We find Jewish, Jewish inscription found in many port towns, including Pompeii, by the way, uh, in South Italy, in Campania, Basilicata, Calabria, Apulia, and Sicily, while we find uh, very few of them north of, uh, of Rome. So in a way, the situation was exactly the contrary of what will happen from uh, the 16th century onwards. So the real problem for, for Jews started uh, rather unsurprisingly, I, I would like to say, with the official recognition of uh, Christianity as the, re the region of the Roman Empire, because the church promulgated laws that would restrict the religious practices of the Jews, limit their political rights, isolate them socially and economically, with uh, also a panoply of measures which were uh, devised in order to try to oblige them to convert to Christianity. So from Constantine onward, Jews were forbidden to owning slaves, intermarriage was forbidden, uh, conversion to Judaism was forbidden, and so on. And bishops even encourage uh, from time to time the population of Rome to violence against the Jews. Synagogues were destroyed and uh, the erection of new synagogue was, uh, was forbidden. And then uh, with the uh, legal code of Theodosius and Justinianus in the fifth and sixth century, the legal status of a Jewish citizen is enshrined in law as an inferior status. So with, uh, we, with the fall, however, of the Roman Empire, the situation of Jews in Italy changed quite often. And it is um, interesting to notice that uh, the part of Italy under the Ostrogoths, uh, the Ostrogoths were quite benevolent towards Jews, I would say. Uh, the Ostrogoths were mainly in, uh, mainly in North and Central Italy. Contrary to the Byzantines who were uh, quite hostile, they persecuted Jews and tried to uh, convert them forcibly like it happened in Apulia in the 9th and 10th century. Sicily was uh, a case apart because Sicily uh, was conquered by the Arab and uh, this Arab con uh, conquest like in Spain proved to be beneficial for the Jews exactly as it happened in, uh, in Spain, at least at first, where Jews were, uh, before the Arabs came, they were persecuted by the Visigoths who had quite a different attitude compared to the Ostrogoths in, uh, in Italy. So uh, already at the year, around, towards the end of the 11th century, we find uh, most Jewish community in South Italy, a sizable community in Rome and very few scattered communities north of Rome, 
very few and very few, um, very few communities and very few Jews north of, of Rome. Uh, the, the famous Jewish traveler Benjamin of Tudela uh, visited South Italy in 1163 and he found flourishing Jewish communities made by hundreds of individuals, uh, most, lots of them in Apulia, which had been established there since uh, many, many centuries. It is interesting that Benjamin of Tudela said that most of Jewish population at that time were artisans, while in fact the trade and the money changing financial activities were dominated by Christians. So it was a situation in the 12th century, which was the contrary, a bit of what we would see uh, uh, a few centuries later. In the 12th and 13th century, the situation does not change with very few and small communities uh, outside Rome, uh, mostly in, uh, in Tuscany, around 200 Jewish families in Rome, which were uh, at the time maintaining good relationship with the Christian population. However, the situation changed uh, in 1215 because there was the lateral, the third Lateran Council, and uh, sorry, the third before and then the fourth in 1215. And uh, basically uh, the Pope at the time decreed that the Jews had to be in a position of uh, perpetual serfdom and were forced to wear a badge on their gar garment so that they could be distinguished from, from Christian. Afterwards, so shortly afterwards, the Inquisition was established in Italy and uh, the, uh, as in Spain, the Dominican friars started to uh, spend uh, some time uh, agitating against the Jews, against the Talmud. Um, agitation in Talmud had started in France, in fact, in 1240. And this uh, uh, reached uh, four decades late, later Italy. The first was in Lombardy, where in fact uh, it was uh, uh, decreed that the Jews from 1278 had to listen to Christian uh, sermons uh, in churches and so on. At that time, the situation was uh, still much better in South Italy. There was a very illuminated monarch, uh, Frederick II, uh, which was king of Sicily, but the king of Sicily at the time also included uh, all the South Italy. He was also the Holy Roman Emperor from 1220. And he was very, very often in great disagreement with the papacy. Uh, the Pope, in fact, the different popes uh, excommunicated him four times. And he extended his personal protection to the Jews and let them live in peace according to the religion, their customs, and gave also, to top it all, um, gave them a complete monopoly of silk weaving and foreign trade. Um, we, uh, unfortunately, uh, then the South Italy passes to the, <clears throat> to the, Fran to the French Angevin, and uh, they, they, they start also in South Italy becoming hostile to Jews, and we have the first case in Italy of blood libel in uh, 12, uh, 1290. So around uh, one half, one, um, one, uh, um, one center and a half after, we have this in, in Norwich when Jews were uh, for the first time falsely accused of ritual murder. You know, there was this boy, the famous William of Norwich who was found dead in the woods. And then this was the first case of blood, uh, blood libel. So a violent campaign started also to convert forcibly the Jews of, uh, of, it, of South Italy. Uh, many of them uh, from 1290 to 1294, uh, many had to convert to Christianity, many fled. Uh, most synagogues were converted into churches and people could only uh, continue to observe the Jewish faith in, in secrecy. So lots of them start, quite a number of them starts uh, leaving the South of Italy. Uh, as well as Rome, because Rome was in a period of turmoil. Uh, it was the period when the Holy See was transferred to Avignon. And uh, they, this is when the, the Jews, they start also to move to central and north Italy to specifically work as money lenders, encouraged by the local rulers who gave them the permission, which was um, limited in time, of course, and against the payment of a tax, to establish a banco, which is, it means a, a pawn bank, uh, in order to, to get around, uh, at the time, the prohibition uh, of the Catholic Church that Christians should not lend money at interest to other Christians. Um, the, 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 the church uh, was, uh, in fact, uh, calling uh, money at the time, uh, lo sterco del demonio, which means um, the devil's shit. So, you know, it was better to let the Jews deal with 
this sort of thing than, than Christians. And then, and then this, uh, at the same time, I mean, and uh, uh, we start uh, with the 14th and the 15th century, we start seeing a lot of uh, persecutions and expulsions which affected Jews in France and Germany. So we have, we start having all these foreign Jews crossing the Alps and settling in the north of Italy, where they also open bank uh, uh, providing loans. Uh, we had all these massacres in, uh, in Germany, which actually started at the time of the first crusade in, in, the, in the 11th century. And then we have the first uh, ritual, the first accusation of ritual murder in Fulda in 1235. So the 14th and 15th century, 13th, 14th, 15th century is a difficult period for German Jews due to multiple accusation of ritual murder, uh, poisoning of the wells, and then we see a lot of expul expulsion, massacres, and so on. So a lot of uh, Jews start moving to Italy from Germany, also from France, because we had the two expulsions from France in the 14th uh, century. Because in spite of, uh, uh, let's say, the situation which was not optimal, the situation in Italy was still much better than uh, uh, the one they could encounter in, in Germany. And of course, they had been expelled from, uh, from France. So we have these uh, uh, Ashkenazi Jews from Germany moving to, especially to uh, the region of Veneto, Lombardia, Emilia, and uh, Piemonte. Uh, and uh, we had the famous uh, Rabbi Yehuda Means arriving in Padua to open a famous rabbinic academy. We also have the famous Rabbi uh, Moshe <coughs> Basola from Basel, uh, became rabbi, rabbi in Ancona. Uh, Joseph Ottolenghi uh, opened a Talmudic academy in Cremona and, and so on. And of course, some of these German Jews brought with them the techniques and knowledge of uh, printing, the famous Soncino families, which came from Germany, and then opened a Jewish printing house uh, in 1477 in Bologna and in 1483 in Soncino, and that's where their surname come, uh, come from. And it, is, it was them who printed the famous, the first Hebrew, Hebrew Bible. Um, yes, so at the same time, look, we have this flow of Jews crossing the Alps from Germany or France coming to Italy, but at the same time, from the 12th century onwards, we also see Jewish family, especially from Rome, moving to other places in central Italy first, and then even to the north, to establish some banki, uh, banks. Uh, so um, we have uh, the activity of uh, loan bankers uh, for Jews flourishing from that moment on, especially in Renaissance Italy, so in the 13th and 14th century, and this resulted in a major shift of the economic activity for the Jews. So we see from the 14th and 15th century, Jews uh, living in the, uh, uh, especially, in, let's say, around the middle um, of the 15th century, they were living in around 300 different localities in Italy, with sometimes members of the same family spreading out in different localities in order to establish subsidiary of this or that, uh, of that bank. So <clears throat> this great spreading of Jews from, uh, um, in central and, and north Italy was strictly linked, uh, coming from, from Rome, of course, was linked to the establishment of, uh, of Jewish banks. Uh, both for theological regions, I said that, that uh, the church always had problems with money, they were calling it the devil's shit, and they had the theological problem with the issue of Christian lending money to other, other Christians. So they, <clears throat> the church considered that it was, uh, uh, let's say, acceptable to accept Jewish money lenders, because the church said, you know, at the very end, you know, Jews will, in any case, go to hell. So, okay, it's better, you know, if they, they will, even if they, they, they lend money, they will still go to hell. And it's better not to uh, let uh, Christian deal with such uh, uh, dirty matters and go to hell uh, themselves. Of course, to, let's say, to uh, operate loan banks, uh, Jews had to pay a, a tax to the local rulers, but also a tax to the church, so a, a tax to the Catholic church. And then, of course, <clears throat> there was economic reason, because, of course, uh, money lending against Poon was a necessity. And uh, 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 even Venice even Venice gave the monopoly of lending against pawns uh, as a monopoly to the Jews in 1366. So we see the, the 14th and 15th century an amazing spread in, of Jewish money lending throughout many times, uh, many towns in Italy. 
uh, Christians were led out of business, both for uh, mostly for religious reasons, and some Jewish families like the Norsa, the Pisa, the, the Pomis, become very powerful moneylenders establishing banks in many localities. Uh, the situation starts, unfortunately, to change in the, 14th, in the 15th century due to the agitation of the monastic orders. So Dominicans and Franciscans, like it was exactly the case in Spain, although the situation was not fully homogeneous in different parts of, uh, of Italy. There were uh, 70, no less than 70 uh, loan banks in the, in the town of Rome uh, in, the 16, in the 16th century. But let's say the monastic orders try to make things difficult for, for Jews because they start establishing this Monti di Pietà, basically, um, which were uh, these places where uh, Christians could, uh, uh, let's say, uh, lend to, to, other, to other Christians. This Monti di Pietà had, uh, were, yes, they were, let's say, competitor of Jews, but they were also plagued by, uh, they had also a difficult life themselves, this Monti di Pietà, because they were plagued by scandals, by uh, misappropriation of funds, by uh, excessive number of personnel uh, working there, so they had to be paid. You can see some similarities with the present, okay, but apart from that. So in fact, you, um, there were many circumstances where they had to be saved by bankruptcy. And uh, although some Jewish moneylending activities come to uh, stop, we also see a new phenomenon, which is basically in an ironic twist of history, uh, many Jews uh, banks rearranging their activity in order to lend to the Christian uh, Monti, Monti di Pietà. And uh, the problem for the Jews were, was that, uh, you know, the, the attitude of the church depended very much on the, on the Pope, on the Pope of the time. And the church, uh, sometimes they, they were pressing for benevolent measures, but other times they were uh, establishing a repressive measure. Uh, and uh, let's say the, the, ma the main theological attacks came in fact again from these Franciscan and Dominican orders, which uh, uh, kept saying that uh, Jews had to be expelled. And uh, uh, they, they included the, the famous uh, infamous charge of ritual murder in Trento, uh, a, a, a town in North Italy in the region of Trentino, Alto Adige, which led to the massacre and expulsion of the whole Jewish community for, uh, from the town. However, uh, at the time, uh, we also had, uh, in the, especially in the 16th century, we see that some Jews uh, moving to, into territories of rulers, which were quite well disposed towards them, such as the Gonzaga dynasty in Mantua, the Este dynasty in Ferrara, and the Medici dynasty in, uh, in Tuscany. So we can, we can say really that uh, um, all in all, uh, the situation uh, in Jews uh, until the 15th century was, uh, till the end of the 15th century, was better than in other in other country. I would like to show you uh, something here, if you can see it. This is the situation in Italy before 1492, and you can see all the Jewish communities. You can see Italy, and there are all Jewish communities basically in the whole of uh, of Italy from north to south before 1490, before 1492. Um, one century later, I will, I will come to this now. This is the situation exactly one century later. So basically there are no more Jewish communities in the south. Uh, in the center of Italy, they are only in Rome and Ancona. Uh, shortly afterwards also, because some small communities in the Marche region will expel the Jews when the, the northern part of Marche will also come under the state of the church. And you can see two regions of the north, Lombardy and Trentino, which also void of Jews because they had come under the uh, ruling of the, of the Spanish king. So in fact, we move from a situation where Jews could be found until 1492 in something like 20 Italian regions to a situation where they were at the most in five and or six, uh, or six regions. What had happened in the meanwhile? Well, in fact, the, the 16th century can be defined as the century of the crisis for uh, Italian, Italian Jew. It starts with the uh, expulsion of Spain from 1492, because at the time, Sicily and Sardinia were also part of the, uh, well, first Argonese and then the Spanish kingdom. So one year later, 
Jews were expelled from Sicily and, uh, and Sardinia. Um, and then uh, shortly afterwards, at the beginning of the 16th century, all the south of Italy also became uh, ruled by, by Spain. So um, this happened in, uh, in, in 1503. Well, let me say first that in fact, uh, Sardinia, there were not many Jews, but Sicily was full of them. There were 40,000 of them. And they, uh, most of them left for continental Italy but also some of them for the Levant, for the Ottoman Empire or uh, Turkey, Greece, North, uh, North Africa. Uh, lots of, for instance, uh, more, many Jews uh, of Sicily left for community of Ancona. Uh, and uh, um, and, uh, uh, and more, many of them went, let's say, north uh, in other Jewish community uh, in Italy. So 19, uh, we have the expulsion in 1492 from uh, Spain. And uh, we see around 9,000 uh, Spanish Jews coming to Italy. From where? Not exactly from the whole Spanish territory, but most, uh, most, Ital most uh, uh, Spanish Jews who reach Italy, and especially the, at, at first uh, South Italy and Rome and uh, they came mostly from uh, uh, the kingdom of Aragon. So the, the regions of uh, uh, Catalonia and uh, Aragon, um, Valencia, um, not, not the Balearic island because there were no more no Jews uh, since one century in the Balearic era at the, ten, at the, at the time of expulsion. A number of them uh, were welcomed in Rome. There was uh, at the time the Pope Alexander VI who was Spanish and he uh, in fact uh, admitted them. He admitted those who were Jews, let's say, that he welcomed Spanish Jews, but he was uh, um, very harsh in the case of uh, uh, converts, converts to Christianity who were then trying also to, to leave Spain to, um, to, reach, uh, to reach Italy. Uh, they also were accepted. It is in interesting to say that at the time, uh, the Jews of Rome tried to prevent uh, the Jews uh, expelled from Spain entering Rome. Uh, they even offer money to the Pope not to let them in, but uh, the Pope let them in in any case. And uh, he, in fact, uh, he was so incensed by this request that he even splashed uh, a high monetary fine against the, the Jews of Rome. We see, we see this also when it came, when it comes to uh, you know Jews arriving in Italy from uh, um, Spain and later on from uh, from Portugal, um, we see sometimes they were welcomed by Italian Jews, but sometimes less so because they fear that uh, um, these Jews would uh, become competitor. They were also opening banks, loan banks, and so on. So the let's say the the welcome was not uh, universal. Uh, yeah, so. And then, so um, I was talking about, yeah, 1492, 1493. And then we have the expulsion from the kingdom of Naples, uh, first in 1510, and then in, uh, only 200 wealthy families were allowed to stay. And then in 1541, it was the uh, final expulsion of Jews from Southern, Southern Italy. And then, so from that moment onwards, South Italy becomes totally void, empty of Jews for, uh, for two or three, three centuries. Uh, as I said, okay, they were on the contrary. Uh, so these, these, these Jews were expelled from South Italy. Some of them go to Rome, but they're also welcomed by Italian rulers like the Medici in Florence, the Este in Ferrara dynasty, the Gonzaga dynasty in Mantua. And uh, even, even in Venice, even in Venice, Venice established the, the ghetto. It was the first ghetto established for the Jews. But at the same time in the 16th century, Venice uh, allows uh, Jews and especially in the, first, in the second part of the 15th century, to come uh, to come to come in. So let's see one second. Um, I, I mentioned the let's say what I what I call the the first phase of the of the arrival of Sephardic Jews in Italy, which was 1492. We had then a second phase after the establishment of the Portuguese Inquisition around 1530. Then there was uh, some sort of reshuffling um, inside Italy uh, or, um, or people um, leaving Italy altogether uh, in the second half of the 16th century for events that we'll, say, we'll see in a second. 
And, uh, and then we see uh, throughout the second half of the 16th century uh, arrival uh, here and there, different groups, small groups of uh, Portu Jews with Portuguese or new Christian with Portuguese surname, which either came directly from Portugal, but also they came indirectly from, uh, from, other, from other countries. Uh, so um, at, at first in the 16th century, the Pope, uh, the popes uh, uh, allowed Jews to come in Rome, uh, in, the, in, the state, in the whole state of the church. Uh, an official Levantine community was established in Ancona in 1535. They were permitted to have their own synagogue. Uh, it's interesting that uh, they didn't even make, they knew in a way that, you know, Spanish Jews were not exactly the same as Portuguese Jews because there was always the risk that a Jew with a Portuguese surname had been uh, a new Christian. But they uh, privileges are, are given to both groups. Uh, and the actual document talks about Hebrais Orientalibus Levantinis. These are the Spanish Jews who were, you know, maybe gone to, had gone to the Ottoman Empire and then they could come back to Italy. But also the same privilege were given to uh, Universitas Hebreorum Lusitanorum Seu Portugalensium. So the two groups were, let's say, combined. Uh, the situation starts getting nasty with uh, a pope, which was called Paul IV. He ruled only for four years, but he made a lot of damage in those four years because uh, he, um, he loses patience with uh, this uh, uh, Portuguese uh, new Christian, especially in Ancona, and he condemns 24 of them to be burned at stake because they were found guilty to have returned to, to Judaism. Uh, many Jews from, uh, many Portuguese Jews from Ancona uh, leaves before they could be uh, taken and uh, put in prison. And in fact, it is interesting how, let's say, many, uh, the first documentary evidence that we have from lots of uh, uh, Portuguese Jewish families uh, in Italy, they, even if they're from Venice or Livorno, and so on, they come from, the first documentary we have are from Ancona are from Ancona, but uh, they all escape when, uh, when uh, the, the Pope, because Ancona was the main port of the papal state in the Adriatic Sea. So uh, there is a first expulsion of, from the state of the church, which was Lazio, Umbria, Marche, and Romagna in 1569, and then a second one in 1593. Uh, at the same time, so in the second half of the 16th century, we have uh, also uh, Venice starting to uh, accept, uh, accept uh, Jews. There was, uh, um, well, they had been accepted before, but then they were expelled. Now they were re-accepted. So in 1573, Venice granted a safe conduct to Spanish and Portuguese Jews to come to, to Venice. And uh, uh, the Pope complained to the Venetian, Venetian ambassador the Venetian ambassador said, yes, but look, I mean, you have, you, you have Levantini Jews of Spanish origin in Ancona. So why are you complaining to us if you accept Levantine Jews from Ancona? And then the, the Pope said, well, the Levantine uh, in Ancona are either Jews or have become Christians and live Christian lives. While it, the one you have in, in Venice, they are, some of them, they are, uh, he called them Marranos, a word I don't like, but okay. They are Maranos and they were baptized and live as Jews. And we have this pressure of the Pope. Now, without entering too much in detail, we have this pressure of the Pope also against Jews, uh, Portuguese and Spanish Jews, which were in, uh, in Ferrara. They were invited in Ferrara in uh, the year 1550. Uh, and the, it's very interesting because the chart of their admittance in Ferrara says, was very explicit and in, in a way provocative. It says, uh, even if for whatever reason be, they have said that they are not Jews and call themselves Christians. So the Este dynasty in Ferrari, they said, okay, you can come even if, you know, you were Christian once, but do come back and so on. Good times in Ferrari didn't last long because the Inquisitor General of Coimbra in Portugal in 1578, he went straight to the Pope announcing that he had a testimony of new Christians returning from Serrara from Ferrara saying that they saw compatriots which are openly circumcised in their children, 
and they were celebrating Jewish rights, going to synagogue, etc. And at that at that moment, the, the ruling dynasty in Ferrara was not so strong as 40 years before. So uh, the good years for Portuguese Jews uh, came to an end, and many of them, some of them left. And the same thing happened also in uh, Pesaro and Urbino, uh, that had to, which also had become a heaven for Portuguese Jews. They had to, many of them had to to leave due to the pressure of the of the church. Um, and uh, in a way, also the same thing happened in Piemonte, because in 1572, uh, the, uh, the Duke had, Emanuele Filiberto had signed uh, a decree stating that his state was open to all the Jewish nation and its stock, be it Italian, German, Spanish, Portuguese, of Levant, Barbary, and, and Syria. And then Jews were guaranteed to... Uh, they were uh, exempted from community taxes. One more reason why they were not seen as uh, uh, in a positive light by Italian Jews. They were uh, exempt from, from taxes uh, and they could conduct any trade or uh, financial operation. There was, for instance, the Mazaot family who established a loan bank in Savigliano. Uh, and of course, this made Italian Jews unhappy. They rushed to the authorities to try to prevent it, but the uh, Duke stood firm and uh, unfortunately, in 1580, the the the, um, the next duke, they he married the daughter of the of uh, the emperor Philip of Spain, and uh, he had to become more serious with uh, those uh, uh, new new Christians. And but they 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 were never actually you know they didn't um, basically what he was doing was to tell them you know it's better if you leave because you have come, become under you know the attention of Spain or Portugal or the Pope so. It was, uh, let's say, there were no big, uh, no, no uh, Jews uh, killed uh, at stake. No, uh, they were not put in prison. They were simply told to leave, and they and they left. Um, yeah. So uh, I was talking about yeah. So in fact, where do we find the main uh, Portuguese uh, communities in uh, in Italy? We find them in, in uh, at first in Ferrara, uh, but we find in Venice, in Livorno. Um, some, some, quite, quite a number of Portuguese Jews in um, went to Padova because Padova was an oasis in the sense that Jews could study uh, at university. And uh, there are uh, uh, we have lists. I will show you later on. There are lists of Jews who, be, who be, got a degree in medicine at the University of Padova. Jews could receive a doctorate in medicine there and. Uh, uh, actually, some of them, you know, when you get the doctorate, you have to be presented and followed by a professor. And some of them were even presented by Galileo Galilei, who had absolutely no animosity towards, uh, towards Jews whatsoever. Uh, he was happy to have Jewish uh, students. So one, one, more re one, one reason more to like him from, <laughs> from this point of view. And then, um, well, uh, I will try to, to, to speed up a little bit. From uh, in the centuries, uh, from the 16, from 1600 to 1800, the ghettos are established in Italy, uh, north of, uh, of Rome. And of course, there is the case of uh, Leghorn, Livorno. Uh, all of us know about the, the Livornina, the uh, privilege that uh, they were offered to uh, uh, Jews uh, of Portuguese and Levantine nation. Uh, lots of privilege. Uh, <clears throat> for instance, they, um, they they basically they offer these Jews uh, to be a, a separate body, a Hebrew nation, ruled by its own laws. Uh, they could practice their own religion, laws, custom, complete legal autonomy. Um, they, they conversion to Christianity were forbidden. This was a big problem before the age of thirteen. And the Jews were free also to move uh, inside the Grand Duchy of, uh, of Tuscany. And they didn't, have, they didn't have to wear a yellow, a yellow sign. So the Livornina became also the center of attention of other uh, rulers, not only inside Italy, but outside. Uh, many Jews start first to Pisa, actually, first to Pisa, because, and only later on to, to Livorno. And uh, yeah, so, and then, uh, we also have the establishment of new communities like Trieste, which had become under Austria in the 18th century, and then French Revolution camps, ghettos are open, they are re-established, and finally the last ghetto, is, uh, which is the one in Rome, 
is finally uh, closed down for good in 18, 1870. Okay, um, there's so much to say, but so little time. Uh, I, I get. I want. I would like to move now to Jewish uh, surnames. Um, they. This. This. I get quite a lot of usually um, question about this or that term. It must be said that uh, Jewish surnames um, arrive quite late uh, in Italy, in the sense that uh, you know, the typical situation was uh, uh, X son of uh, Y for Jews. They didn't have uh, proper surnames. Ex apart from the most famous families like the Finzi, the Treves, the Foa, and, and so on. Uh, and then um, um, basically they, they start uh, uh, having surnames uh, quite late. Um, the Italian population had already surnames in the 13th and 14th century, uh, but uh, it, is very, it is quite difficult unless you have your, let's say, you're lucky to have one of these uh, surnames, which were the most, uh, belong usually to the most powerful families. Uh, surnames crystallized in Italy in the 16th, in the 16th century. And they, um, they take mostly uh, geographical surnames. So um, my, own, my, my region, Marche, uh, you have uh, 23 uh, different uh, Jewish surnames coming from that region, it's a small region. Uh, including the famous Montefiore surnames, which people in England know very, very well. But at the same time, you have the Italianization of Ashkenazi surnames, which came with geographical surnames, or um, Sephardic, uh, Sephardic surnames. Like uh, um, you see the uh, Jews with the, the surname, um, like uh, uh, Lusitano, Castellan, Navarra, Algranati, uh, Almanzi, Campos, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, um, yeah, so, okay, we, <clears throat> we have lots of uh, geographical surnames uh, in Italy, and of course, we have also surnames of different origins, Sephardic, Ashkenazi, or, um, of course, we have all the Cohen, the Levi, you can think of, which in some regions, the Cohen were called Sacerdoti, which means priest, so, uh, but okay. I would like now to, um, I see time running, <laughs> which makes me a bit uh, anxious. I would like to, um, to talk about, uh, some of you have asked me um, some uh, questions about this or that, uh, or that family. Um, so, um, Let's, uh, let's see. Um, we had, uh, um, I'm trying to look my, my paper. So um, I think that, uh, um, yeah, so here it is. So the first one is the Toby or uh, someone asked about the Toby family. Uh, we find them in uh, documented in 5052 in Ancona uh, and they were, I think, part, one of those families, many families who left Ancona after Jews were burned, at, Portuguese Jews were burned at, uh, at stake. We found them in 1596 in, uh, in Venice. Uh, there is the record of Emmanuel Toby, who was a merchant uh, in 1624. He was approved to be a merchant in the, um, in the, uh, by the Cinque Savi alla, alla Mercanzia. Um, and then we find them in Livorno from 1626. Uh, lots of records in uh, Livorno uh, during the 17th century. Uh, last marriage recorded in Livorno of the Toby family was in 1749. From Livorno, uh, branch moved to Tunisia. We find them also in Amsterdam. Uh, there is a record of a Jewish marriage. They, they, the one in Amsterdam, actually, they, the one in Amsterdam came from Venice. And we find them also in Hamburg. In Rome, in the 18th century, there are members of the Toby family, uh, London, and so on. Interestingly, there are also records of people with this surname in Portugal in the 15th century. Toby and Tubi, yes, I, I just read the, the question. Toby and Tubi, it was the same surname. Uh, we find, uh, I found uh, someone called Toby in, uh, in uh, between 1442 and 1490. 
in different localities in Portugal, in uh, Marialva, in uh, Landosa, in uh, Portimao, in the Viana do Alentejo, different localities. This is documented. Um, and then also we find them in Bulgaria, Morocco, Turkey, Algeria, Tunisia. There's a lot to say. Interestingly, the first uh, uh, Toby uh, from which we have document is found in Huesca uh, in 1190, and uh, then which is a part of Aragon, and then also in uh, in the following century in in Toledo. So uh, and. On the eve of the expulsion, there was a Toby in Medina de Pomar in 1491. Okay, then uh, Provençal de Leon, surname. Uh, we find them in um, lots of, uh, in, in, in the, the surname Provençali, which was the Italianization, but also Provençal, because sometimes surname has small variation. We find them in Voghera, Mantova, Roma, Florence, Livorno. <clears throat> Uh, we find uh, Jacob Ben David Provençal in the 15th century, who is the ancestor from the Provençal family in, uh, in Mantua. We find them in Cremona in the 17th and 18th centuries. We find them in uh, Cuneo. Uh, it's, not, it's not, you know, Provençale was, it means that he came from the region of Provenza. So it is not fully sure that it was always the same, uh, the same, uh, the same family. And, uh, and then from now on, so in Livorno, we find them from 1675. In Amsterdam, we find this De, on, De Leon Provençal in 1671. Uh, and uh, we find the Provençal de Leao in 1732, which came from Mantova. Uh, and then uh, also from, from Livorno. Uh, you know, there's so much to say, but so little time and so many. So then uh, I was asked about the Mediado family in Turin. In Turin. Um, the first, uh, um, the first reference I find is Isaac Migliau. It was, Migliau was called Migliau in Piemonte in 1614. So the, 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 the person who uh, sent me this question said, okay, the first ancestor I have is Solomon in 1694. In fact, uh, Isaac was, is documented in 1614. Uh, and also uh, we find them in 1626 in the in a census which was uh, which was uh, uh, in uh, which was undertaken in uh, it was the census of all uh, merchants in Piemonte and of all the um, people who were artisans and so on. So he's documented in the census in Turin in 1626. Uh, it was the, the most, the, it was the richest, you know, because they had to pay tax. So from the tax he paid, it was the richest uh, merchant uh, of the Jewish community in Turin. We, we find then uh, Giuditta Migliau in 1629. And in 1702, we find uh, two different uh, uh, households in, in Turin. I was asked about the Balabrego family. Uh, the surname comes from Valabreg, which is a town in the Gard region in France. We find them in Italy in Piemonte, Milan, Genoa, uh, Turin, Rome, Novara. And I understand that the, 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 those uh, with this surname in Amsterdam in 1747 came from uh, Piemonte. Uh, we find them also in Genoa in the 18th century in uh, Hamburg. And uh, Let's say that uh, the earliest uh, reference I find is in Cuneo, the town of Cuneo, south of Piemonte in 1695, uh, Susanna uh, Balabrega. Uh, sorry, sorry, not, uh, sorry, I was mistaken, not in Cuneo, in, uh, in Turin. So in Turin, in the census of 1702, we find five different Valabrega households, of which four had children. So, um, voila. So uh, this is the, the origin. Um, no, actually, I, I was right. In fact, they, they were in Turin in the, 18th century, in the 17th century, but they originate from Cuneo, because we find in 1584, Abram Valabrega in, uh, in Cuneo, which received a permission from the Duke of Savoia to uh, trade. And, uh, and then uh, five years later, a few years later, we find Bonenfant, Bonenfant Valabrega, in five, uh, 1591, he got the permission from the Duke 
to uh, open a loan bank in Nizza, in Nice, together with Leone Ascoli. Yeah, my, 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 the same surname I have, but okay. they were partners in this endeavor. I was, called, I was asked about the Nunes Weiss from Turin. Uh, I find no trace of Weiss or Vass in uh, Piemonte. However, uh, there is Antonio Nunes, uh, who was a Portuguese banker in 1518 in Turin, and he entered into a legal dispute with Lopes, another one called Lopes, about a loan bank in the town of Pinerolo, uh, because a group of Portuguese Jews had received permission in 1575 to open a loan bank in Pinerolo for 10 years. Then we find also Nunes in uh, members of the Nunes family in Asti, always in Piemonte, in 1661. Uh, uh, it's, it's a sad story. The daughter converts to Christianity. And I think that perhaps for this reason also they, he leaves Asti. And uh, um, we find then after that uh, members of the Nunes family in, uh, in Livorno, in Leghorn. Uh, in 1795, um, but they disappear from, uh, from Piemonte. The pass, I was asked about the, the pass from Pisa. The pass are uh, in so many different places in Italy. Um, they, you, the first the pass documentary is found in Ancona in 1549. Uh, but then also in Ferrara shortly afterwards, we find them in Venice in the, at the end of the 16th century. And in the 17th century, we find them in Padova, in Pisa, uh, Livorno, and other places. <clears throat> uh, in uh, Pisa, yes, we find uh, Jacob de Paz, who was born in 1578. He, had, uh, um, he was very wealthy. He had 2,000 uh, escudos. It was the second richest family in, uh, in Pisa. And uh, later on, they seem to, like many other Portuguese Jews in Pisa, they moved to Livorno. And Abraham de Paz uh, marries in 1642 Clara de Miranda. And then we have lots of marriages and lots of Jewish people called de Paz in, uh, in Livorno. Um, OK, then uh, Arias family from Pisa. Um, Yes, uh, Isaac Arias is documented in 1599 in Pisa. He was one of the Massaro of the, of the community. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, um, we find them also in Amsterdam, uh, Leghorn, uh, Venice, and so on. There, there are um, uh, Samuel Cohen Arias was a doctor in 1677. He belonged to the confraternity of Mohara Betulot. Uh, again, so much to say, but <laughs> little time. Uh, and then we find the marriages of, uh, of uh, the Arias, members of the Arias family in Livorno. He married uh, David of uh, Abraham Arias, marries uh, Sara Alvarez in 1668. He becomes a Massaro in 1697 and, and so on. Uh, Ergas, oof, this is a family where a whole book can be written about it. In fact, there is a book. I will show it to you. This book is uh, half of it. It's about the Ergas, uh, Ergas family. Um, it's called, uh, the author is uh, Trivellato. Um, and uh, the first Ergas is actually documented in Ancona in 1546. Lo lots of Portuguese Jews are first documented in Ancona, Italy, uh, before the disaster of 1556. And then uh, they are documented in Livorno in 1627, coming from Pisa. Abraham Ergas was in Pisa in 1603, Livorno in 1627, and then understand the family moves to London at the end of the 17th century. And uh, uh, actually, in this book, which I the one I showed you before, it is explicitly said that the first Ergas to arrive in Tuscany is Abraham Ergas, son of Isaac. And he's called Ebreo Levantino. So he, he, he would probably, they arrived there from the Ottoman Empire. Perhaps he went, they went to Pisa at first because they were, uh, had been baptized. I, we don't know, but the, it says that uh, it, they came, they, they are first, let's say, recorded in Italy, uh, uh, at first in Ancona, coming from the, from the east and then to, to Livorno. Then uh, there, ah, there is a full, in this book, the one I show you, there is a full genealogic trees 
of the air gas from uh, Livorno. So if you're interested in air gas family. Sarfati, well, this is a difficult uh, surname because there are so many. Uh, we find them for, at first in Venice, in Italy, in 1557. And then those uh, in Amsterdam actually came from uh, Venice, we understand. But also uh, they were in Hamburg, in Genoa, and in many, many different parts of Italy. I got a question about the Sasso family. Uh, there is uh, someone, uh, a Jew called Sasso in Bologna in 1489. And uh, however, after, shortly after, the, the surname seems to disappear from Italy. And it, they're from the town of Sasso Marconi, which is actually close to Bologna. So no surprising. Uh, Sacchi, the Sacchi family, um, we find uh, Sacchi or Sacchi. We find them in uh, uh, the first one, actually, it's very interesting because we find the first one in Rome in 1553, and they seem to have been Sic Sicilian Jews before the expulsion from Sicily and the south of, uh, of Italy. We have uh, a surname which is similar, like Sacco or Sacche, in Sicily. So, and the fact that they arrived, they are documented as first in Rome, also might be, uh, let's say, might indicate that they came from, uh, from, from Sicily. Uh, Isaac Saki was in Pisa in 1613, and uh, a Saki with a strange name actually, because he's called Girolamo, so it's a bit suspicious, but he was in Livorno, a uh, member of the Jewish community in 1645. Uh, last surname, the Meldola, the Meldola family. Um, you, uh, there is, there is uh, some, there is a story, uh, some sort of legend where they say that they were from Toledo in, uh, in Spain. Uh, I'm happy to, to say that this is not true. Uh, this, this story of them coming from Spain, in spite of having a full Italian surname, because Meldola, it's a town in Italy, which is close to, uh, which is in Emilia Romagna, not far from Mantua. Uh, the family is attested in fact in this town in Meldola in the 15th century. And then Jacob Meldola becomes a rabbi in Mantua in the 16th century. They, <coughs> they, a branch, because they were spread also in different parts of it, a branch came to Livorno, where it is said that the family suffered uh, itself. But for instance, he was a rabbi, another one was a rabbi in Verona in 1622 and so on. So this legend see, that they came from Toledo seems to have originated from the fact that uh, um, uh, Sephardic Jews in uh, in um, in um, in England, I understand, in the 18th century, they someone drew uh, a genealogic tree, uh, starting from uh, de them in the 13th century coming from Toledo. But as I said, it is probably a legend, and it is recognized as such in serious serious text. Yeah, so. Uh, Maybe we should go, uh, if we have some, a little time more, I should go, maybe I would like to present you my favorite books for uh, the um, history of Jews in Italy. Uh, the first one I would like to present is this one. It has been for me a discovery. It is published in Avotain. Here it is. It's called Alexander Bider, a dictionary of Jewish surnames from Italy, France and Portuguese communities. It is a book of 900 pages. 100 pages are devoted to the history of uh, surnames of Italian and Portuguese Jews, most, most Portuguese Jews. They discuss the origin, uh, the variants, uh, how they spread around Europe and the Americans in the Mediterranean world, the surname. And then surname by surname, they tell you where you can find the surname town by town uh, in Italy, but also in the Sephardic world, Amsterdam, Lisbon, Hamburg, and so on. The etymology of the surname, uh, there, are, there are mistakes, um, it's not fully complete, but it is very, very useful. It also dispels a lot of mythology uh, around some of the surnames, explaining why some hypotheses cannot be retained. And it is very interesting because it has a very rich bibliography and point out at which book you should look for every locality in which your surname is, uh, is found. The second book I would like to bring to your attention is this one. It's a uh, Fagenboy. It's in Portuguese and, and English. It's called uh, Dicionario 
uh, Sephardi the, the Sobrenomes or Dictionary of Sephardic Surnames, also published by Avotain. It is not, not as rich as the previous one, but I use it as a complement because it tells you also where the surname is placed, is found, the bibliography, but also even if there is no etymology and no year in which the surname is to be found. So I use it as a complement to the first one. I check my own, I check my own surname as a, and uh, you can find it in 22 different localities in the first book and 17 in the, in the second book. And if you're lucky, in the second book, you also have the emblem of your, of your family. It's a bit folkloristic, but okay, <laughs> they collected to this. So let's start now to see, let's say, this, these are books of uh, general interest uh, for everyone. For, but let's go now to the most interesting book for every region in Italy. The one, if, you're, if you have an interest about Jews of Piemonte, the, the most useful by far is this one, The Jews of Piemonte by Renata, Renata Segre. It's in three volumes and it's a, it's a magnificent collection of uh, names and documents and events from 1297 to 1798. It's full of facts. Uh, I, I recently work uh, with a friend of mine on, on one family. This friend of mine maybe is listening to us, Mario Camerini. Hi, Mario, if you're there. He does beautiful uh, genealogic trees of Jewish families. And uh, I studied the Segre family and I found no, not, not less than 445 uh, individuals uh, of the Segre family included in this, uh, in this book. Um, it is also extremely useful, extremely useful because it has census data for no less than 15 towns in Piemonte with other census uh, for the whole of Piemonte concerning merchant, bankers, artisans, and so on. So if you have some ancestor who at some stage live in Piemonte, start from this book because mm. it's wealth of information and you have full census data, meaning family by family, it says, okay, there was this family in this year, a lot from the 18th century, but also from the 7th century, even describing the whole household of every, every family. And then there are also from Piemonte, many books which are uh, of a local origin, also with census type data. This one is about, for instance, in Mondovi. There are many of them, so I will not uh, mention them, but these are, there are specific books for different localities in Piemonte, but the one I showed you before, it really encompasses the whole, the whole region. If you had ancestor coming from Genoa or Liguria, this is by far the best book you can, you can find. It is Urbani and Zazu, the Jews of Genoa. It's in the same spirit of the one before. It's a collection of documents about, it's in two volumes, collection of documents about Jews from 507 to 1799. And there are lists of Jews living in Genoa uh, in 1705, 1724, 1735, 43, and so on. We find Sephardi, well, of course, we find Sephardic surnames also in the book I, I told you before about Piemonte, but here also we find uh, members of the Rosas, Alvarez, uh, Mocatta, Fonseca, Costa, Lucena, Arias, and so on. For Lombardy, so <clears throat> not only Milano, but the whole of Lombardy, this is the most uh, useful here. So it's about the same spirit of the two books uh, above. You find a collection of, uh, of documents and many, many from um, So we look up. Can you, can you give us the title of the book? Because right. um, the title is the Jews, the Jews in the Duchy of Milan, in the Jews in the Duchy, Duchy of Milan by uh, Simonson. It is a, it's in Thank four you. volumes, a huge wealth of information about Jews living in, uh, in Lombardy. Incredibly interesting. Uh, incredible, okay. Then for, uh, if you have ancestors, when I say Lombardy, I don't mean Mantua. Mantua was a case apart because it was uh, uh, a duchy. And uh, <clears throat> so there is also the same author wrote the history of the Jews in the duchy of Mantua, which I don't have here, but it's in the same spirit. So let's say that if you have really ancestor from Northwest Italy, Piemonte, Lombardia, Liguria, uh, Mantua, these four books will uh, help you a lot because it's a collection of thousands of documents about 
the Jews living there until the beginning of the 18 uh, until the beginning of the of the 19th century. And then, <coughs> uh, what about so? Let's move uh, east from Lombard, Lombardy East. We find the region of Veneto, and I would like to show you this book, Benjamin uh, uh, Ravid. It's called Studies on the Book in Venice. Studies, studies on the Jews in Venice, sorry. Uh, okay, there is a lot of, uh, it's in English. There is a lot of information, but what I like more is that there is a, a list, there is a list of uh, Jewish merchants approved by the Venetian authorities in the 17th uh, century. So you have uh, from 1600 to 1699, a list of uh, Jewish merchants with many, many uh, Sephardic uh, uh, families uh, or Portuguese, uh, Portuguese surname. Uh, actually, they're almost all, uh, I can see here, they're almost all uh, Sephardic or Portuguese uh, surname, surname here. And then I would like also to show you this book. It's Cristina Treves. Uh, L'oblio e il ricordo. It was a book, it's a book uh, written about one family, the Trevers. But what is good in this, uh, in this book is that there are the full census of 1797 in Venice. So Cristina Treves, this is it. The full census of, uh, um, of, uh, in Venice of 1797, uh, family by family, uh, listing all the people, uh, their age, where they were living, and here again, we have, of course, uh, Sephardic and Portuguese surname. Third book and last book about Venice. This is it, Federica Ruspio, La Nazione Portoghese. You have uh, lists of uh, Portuguese Jews in the 16th and 17th century, which lived in Venice from 1567 uh, onwards which were active in trade. It is a list which the author drew, drew using registers of notaries. So for instance, the past, the, the past family is mentioned there. So you have all this list about uh, Portuguese Jews in Venice in the 15th and 16th century. Uh, <coughs> Veneto, but out of, um, out of Venice, you have uh, this, uh, this book. Uh, so it's about Eastern Veneto. It's the, the authors are Giovanni and Silvia Tomasi, Ebrei nel Veneto Orientale. And you have uh, many lists of Jews in that part of Veneto from 15th, 16th and 17th century. Hundreds of people are mentioned. It can also be interesting. <clears throat> Going back to Venice, I would like to present you this book. It's from uh, Artom, Il Patto di Abramo. And you have here lists of hundreds of circumcisions in Venice from 1776 to 1872. Okay, it's, it's only from 1776 onwards, but it's a useful complement to the, to the book uh, I, I presented you before. This book is important. It's about, it's the best book you can find about Verona. There were, uh, I found uh, it's from Alberto Castellini, La segregazione apparente, and then there are uh, mentioned there are the list of the Jews in Verona from the 15th to the 17th century. I find uh, uh, Sephardic families, the Navarra, the Nunes, Fonseca, Enriquez, Meldola also, even if it's uh, <laughs> it is Italian, but we discussed it before. So this is about Verona. Uh, this is about uh, uh, Trieste. Trieste. Uh, <clears throat> You can see uh, the author, Carlo Gatti, and the title is Gli Ebrei di Trieste nel Settecento. You have list of all Jewish immigrants to Trieste from 1725 to 1765. And it's interesting because you have full census data for 13, uh, 1735, 1765, 1775. And here again, we find also lots of surnames which might be familiar to you, uh, Alpron, Capriles, Curiel, Navarro, Parente, Almeida, Camondo, Campos, Sara, Saralvo, Saraval, and so on. <clears throat> I was talking before about uh, Padova and its university. And this book, in fact, uh, show, uh, have hundreds of Jews who pass uh, through the University of Padova. 
uh, and got a degree in medicine in Padova from 1670 to 1870. I find again uh, quite a lot of, of uh, Portuguese or Sephardic families, uh, Alpron, Fonseca, Benveniste, Calvo, Capriles, Cardoso, Pereira, and so on. So it, it also gives information on you know, the thesis, who was the professor, uh, also useful documentation about the family and so on. In fact, let's say all the books which I uh, discussed until now is not only a collection of names, but it provides a very useful context for um, even about the context of the situation and also for different uh, Jewish families. We mentioned Ferrara. This is my favorite. I mean, there are many, but this is my favorite. Uh, Laura Graziani Secchieri, Ebrei a Ferrara. Why is, it my why is it my favorite? Because it provides full census data for 1692. I will show you just one page. So you have family by family, the census data from 1692, showing how many people there, um, uh, where they were living, um, their, their age, and so on. So it's a wealth of information for whoever was in Ferrara. The, to, the, the complete information about Jewish community in Ferrara from 1692. Uh, next to Ferrara, we had uh, Modena and, uh, and Reggio. These were parts of the domain of the rulers of Ferrara, but then they lost the Este family. They lost Ferrara, but they could maintain Modena and Reggio. And this is a book which uh, is not very known, actually. It's called uh, From Aaron di Leone Leoni. La nazione, ebraica, la nazione ebraica spagnola e portoghese negli stati estensi. Now, it is interesting because there are lists of many Sephardic Jews or Portuguese Jews in Modena and Reggio Emilia. Uh, the longest list is from 1657, but it tells you also where they came from. So in fact, you can see that this, I don't know, this Sephardic or Portuguese Jews was in Modena or Reggio Emilia in that year. And they came from Livorno, Venice. I, I found people, I found some of them coming from Livorno, from Venice, from Amsterdam, from Hamburg, from Izmir, Salonica, uh, Ancona, and so on. So, um, the, and it is, they're all Sephardic, uh, all Sephardic uh, Portuguese, uh, all Portuguese surname. You have, uh, in, in the list I was mentioned, there are 59 Portuguese families. And, uh, uh, and then it's mentioned, for instance, that uh, the, the Nieto family, the Nieto family came from Amsterdam, the Lopes came from Amsterdam, the Salcedo came from Amsterdam, Rabello came from, so you have, it's, I think it is not very known, but, uh, the, but there were quite a lot of Sephardic Portuguese families in those two towns. We go south, we move to Tuscany, to Livorno. Well, many of you, I think, are familiar with this. It is the Registre de Ketubot de la Nation Juive de Libor. So you have hundreds of marriages recorded from 1626 to 18, uh, 1890. Uh, it, uh, it's, it says often who is married with who and who was their father. Uh, very, very useful indeed. But there are, I think, even, even if, if you allow me, even, even more interesting books. For instance, this is a book I love. It's Ariel Toaf, La Nazione Ebrea a Livorno e a Pisa from 1591 to 70. If you have someone coming from Livorno and Pisa, get this book if you can, because it's a complete list of households for both towns, as well as list of traders, uh, members of confraternities, Massaria. It's a, it's a wealth of information for more than 700 pages. The same period, let's say the, the from 1591 to to, um, but even, even, let's say, to a larger extent, is also in this, uh, in this, uh, in this book. Um, Lucia Fratelli Fischer, Vivere fuori dal, dal ghetto. Vivere fuori dal ghetto. And uh, um, it is, uh, it, it has also many census lists. It's interesting because it indicates also the wealth of individuals, the households, and when I read it, I was surprised by the, the high number of, uh, of, of people and of households which are uh, basically uh, indicated with povero, poor, or misero, very poor, or miserrimo. 
very very poor uh which might explain also why people emigrated from uh, from livorno from livorno this is a book also about Livorno, but it provides also the uh, link between Amsterdam and Tunis. So it follows family who were from Livorno, but who ended up in Amsterdam and Tunis. I'm sure many of you know this. Um, and it's all Lionel Levy, La Nation Juive Portuguese. Uh, it talks really focused about the mobilities of Jews of Livorno towards Amsterdam and Tunis. There are long list of uh, names of families in the different towns. And uh, so it's very, it's very nice. Uh, I was mentioning this book uh, before. It talks, it's very, very interesting. It talks about the Sephardic trade, a lot about uh, the Ergas uh, family. And something which I found quite interesting in, uh, in this book, it's actually, if I, I will put it down, um, it's actually, um, there are lists of wills, there are lists of wills of uh, uh, Jews in uh, Livorno, which were uh, Livorno in Pisa, which were registered in London, and this is why these families had were from Livorno or Pisa, but had a commercial interest in London. So when they establish a will, they also register this in uh, in London, in order to uh, because because it was of commercial commercial interest. And here again, you find lots of Sephardic families, as you can, but you find lots of families who. Uh, let's say Portuguese families in Livorno, who had uh, lots of commercial interests in London, like Ergas, Carvalho, Rodriguez, Peña, Atias, and so on. Uh, this, if you if you have someone from Florence, this book contains full census data from 1808, with Sephardic. Uh, uh, there are also Sephardic families inside and uh, uh, so you can see it from Viterbo, La Comunità Ebraica di Firenze in Censimento in 1841. The same author also wrote this one, this book, about the communities of uh, Siena and Pitigliano, but I will not dwell so much on this. It's, uh, again, you have census data from the beginning of the 19th century, uh, but not, these were mainly Italian communities, so you will not find many, many Portuguese surname there. A book I would like to recommend, but uh, because it talks about, it, this, it is this one. It is Jews in Massa e Carrara from, uh, uh, from Jacopetti. Now, it is interesting because very few people know that a lot, quite a lot of Jews in Livorno came, in fact, from Massa and, uh, and Carrara. There are the genealogic trees of families like the Uziel families and so on. And when, even when I speak to some specialists, they were not aware of this, let's say, great immigration to Livorno from Massa and Carrara. Many Italian Jewish families from Livorno, in fact, originate from Massa and, uh, and Carrara. We go to my region, the Marche. This is a very uh, interesting book. It's called Luciano Allegra. It's called Una Lunga Presenza. And it is very interested, interesting because you have full census data for 1626 for Pesaro, Urbino, and Senigallia, uh, uh, which were the only three towns where you would uh, you could have a Jewish community in the northern part of Marche from 1626. You also have full census data in 1761 from uh, Ancona. It's unfortunately it's uh, it's a bit later, 1761, but you have census data, and you will find. Uh, uh, many, uh, let's say, uh, but it was mostly, to say the truth, it was mostly Levantine Sephardic than Portuguese Jews, but you find uh, surnames, many servants like Algranati, Campos, Corcos, Peres, Alcostantini, and, uh, and so on. Uh, the Marche region, um, the problem was what happened in 1556, so uh, Portuguese Jews left, even if Levantine Jews were, were welcome. And if you're interested in the town in Ancona, you have this, this book of Luca Andreoni, Una Nazione in Commercio. You have census data again for the most uh, important families, all the families in Ancona in the 18th centuries at interval of 10 years. Right. If we move to Rome now, going south, we move to Rome. Uh, you have the whole series of Shlomo Simonson, 
the Apostolic See and, uh, and the Jews, 3,250 3, documents about Jews in the Middle Age and also in the 16th and 17th century. Uh, you have to look a little bit, but uh, you also find, of course, uh, uh, it's, it's a wealth of documentation for the history of Jews in Rome uh, until the 17th century. And in the 18th century, I would like to show you this book um, in the 18th century, because um, this book has full census data. So it is uh, Angela Groppi, full census data of the whole Jewish community in Rome for 1733. This is where I found the Toby family, for instance. And there are also many other uh, family with uh, Sephardic uh, surnames. If you're interested in Sisimi, I have this. Uh, again, Simonson is a very prolific uh, Jewish history author. So history of the Jewish in uh, Storia di Ebrei in Sicilia. Again, uh, it presents many surnames. Also, I must say that, the, let's say, the surnames it shows, and of course, the whole context, the surnames it shows are very different from the one we are accustomed in North and Central Italy, because they were expelled everyone in, uh, in 1493. Uh, surnames did not have full time to consolidate there. And you find a lot of surnames of Arabic origin. Uh, although you find also some Italian sounding surname and a few Sephardic like Barceloni and so on. For Apulia region, there is this book. It's uh, La Presenza Brighta in Puglia. Uh, it refers to the, you find the documents about the 16th century in Puglia, especially the, it's from, uh, yeah, it's from the archive of Bari. And you find a lot of documents about uh, uh, just before the expulsion. So let's say the 50 years before uh, Jews were expelled from, uh, from South Italy. So you find documents until uh, 1540, 41, but not, not, not many Sephardic ones. Finally, I wanted to show you <coughs> um, this book. Well, actually, there are two books. This is where, if I see a Portuguese uh, sounding surname, I start looking at. This is where I find for I found, for instance, all these Tobies from different towns in uh, in, in Portugal. So it's uh, uh, Ferro Tavares, os judeus in Portugal no século XV. You have thousands of surnames of Portuguese Jews in from 1384 to 1496, town by town. Occupation. They show also the occupation. So you have. If you are looking for some uh, ancestors in Portugal, although there is the problem, of course, that they change uh, the, the surnames, but uh, in the, in, uh, they, they assume a more, let's say, Christian surname. But some of them are, you can find some of them here. There are literally thousands of, uh, many thousands of them. Sorry, Luca, what yeah. was the name of the author again? Fer the surname is Ferro Tavares. Tavares. Ferro Tavares. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, Anna uh, Maria. Sorry? Yeah. Anna Maria Tavares. Ferro, Ferro Tavares. Mm -hmm. Ferro is the first surname. Maria Jose, well, actually, it's very complicated. I will show it again. Maria yeah. Jose Pimenta Ferro Tavares. Thank you. Okay. For Spain, <laughs> for Spain, I start looking usually on Sephardic gen. They only, they don't provide much context, but it's a, let's say, good uh, source of information. If you're looking for something, some Spanish, uh, um, if your ancestor were expelled from Spain, and this book as well, because it contains um, it contains um, thousands of surnames, providing context. Let's say it says also from, you know, this person was coming from this town, and uh, you can find information on this book. So this is also uh, quite useful. Well, from Hamburg, Amsterdam, I will not speak in, in the presence of so many experts from Amsterdam, so I say nothing. But <laughs> for Hamburg, this is uh, also a very interesting book. It's, uh, you, I, I'm sure many of you know it. It's a Biographisches Lexicon der Hamburger Sephardim. You have thousands of tombstones of Sephardic Portuguese community in the, in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century in Hamburg. Finally, as I said, many Italian Jews left Italy to go to the East in, um, in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire. 
And this book, it's about the history of the Italian Jews in Levante. It's from Attilio Milano, and it uh, shows you uh, <clears throat> this outflow of Italian Jews towards Greece, Turkey, Israel, and so on. So, and that explains the phenomenon that why you can find so many Italian Jewish surnames in, uh, in Salonico, in uh, Istanbul, in, uh, and so on, in Israel itself, and so on. Um, for Tunisia, uh, you have this book. Uh, as we saw, I mentioned it just because we see later on many families from Livorno going to Tunisia. And uh, this is about, it provides also surname and some context about, uh, uh, and you find here many of the same uh, families in Livorno, which you find them in this book about the Jews of Tunisia. I'm sorry if I spoke too much. I can see that it's 9.30, <laughs> but uh, okay, I, I come to an end of my presentation. I hope, uh, I hope it was interesting for you and mm -hmm. I give the floor back to you, Tom. Yeah. It's uh, fascinating, Luca. Thank you very much. Uh, one first question that uh, has been put to us uh, many times. Can you provide a list of these books so that we can post it somewhere, uh, for example, on sephardicgenealogy.com or on Facebook? Yes. Is that possible? Yes, I will I will do a list of, uh, of these books and then I will... Um... Well, I can even compliment it because there are many other books uh, concerning Italian Jews. I will mm -hmm. do it and then I will uh, send it to you. That's really kind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have time for a few questions, uh, David? I, I think so. Um, is it okay just to Adam, Adam Brown, if I can unmute you? And just if you could make a, a brief mention of of your work, um, if that's possible. I've asked you to unmute. I don't know if you can. I'm sorry. I'm on a Mac. Um, oh, I can unmute. I'm good now. Uh, Adam. Adam. Hi. 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 Nice <laughs> to see you. Of course. Well, it's very nice to see so many of my friends on the call today, from all over the place, New York and uh, Israel and uh, Europe. And uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, I am the uh, project administrator of an academic study of the history of the Jewish community worldwide. And we're building on, there's been a lot of work done on the uh, Ashkenazi communities, but very little done on the non-Ashkenazi communities. And uh, Italy has been very interesting to us because for the reasons that uh, Luca discussed, it's a crossroads of Jewish populations for the last uh, 2000 years. And we've been able to, by doing Y DNA testing of men, uh, we've been able to demonstrate how these families have migrated. Uh, I'll give you an example if uh, Luca doesn't mind. Um, <laughs> uh, his lineage uh, is a particularly interesting one because we find it um, all over uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. So we have a family, we have it in Hungary. We have it on the Isle of Rhodes. We have it in Yanina in Greece, which has been a Greek speaking Jewish community. Uh, a Della Rosa family, Spitzokomo family, a couple I have to ask you about. Uh, Gigi Damante, who's on the call today and as an Alstri family, we don't know who they are and there's a Gaj family. So we have some, we also have a family from um, Port of Spain, Trinidad who was part of your group. So these are all descendants of a man who probably lived six, 700 years ago. And, uh, but we've been able to, by testing men at our expense, uh, the project's expense, we've been able to pull together the threads of the Jewish world of the Mediterranean. And uh, a lot of, uh, a number of the families that you discussed today, Luca, indeed we have found in the Ottoman Empire, as you, as you predicted at the close of your talk. So, um, and uh, so this is something we're very excited about and uh, we're working with the Technion and with the University of Haifa and uh, universities in the United States. Uh, so we encourage all of you to participate. It's simply a cheek swab, about a two minute cheek swab. And we mail a kit out and a kit comes back and we are publishing our results. And we have a, you can read about some of them at our website, uh, abotenoonline.com. 
And uh, we gave a talk in July. And if David's kind enough, we'll give another talk uh, in the spring. And we'll bring you up to date on what we've learned. Because every day we get another dozen kits uh, coming in. And uh, the stuff we've learned is a very interesting background on the surname studies that Luca discussed just now. There's a lot of interesting correlation. We see a lot of Ashkenazim in the north of Italy. You know, we can see no matter what the surname is, Castle Nuevo, we can see that this was actually a Ashkenazi family that found its way into Italy in the last thousand years. So we can pull together a lot of the threads that, uh, that you're, you've been working on. And uh, there's no limit to the number of Italian families we'd like to test because they're absolutely fascinating. So there you have it. What else? Right. Do you have any questions, David, that I need to answer? No, no, thank you. It's, it's, it's just I, I, I thought we have a sort of captive audience, so it would be good to I uh, appreciate get the message it. out. I appreciate it. And uh, right. we're happy to talk to any of you who have questions about, you know, this family or that family. Do you, what do you know about the origins of it? We're happy to talk to you about it. So you can um, email me at adam.brown at avotenodna.org, or you can Google Adam Brown and Avoteno, and I'm sure I'll pop up. Great. Many, many thanks. Thank you very much, David, for letting me say that. Thank you. Mm. Um, uh, so, sorry, Ton, Ton um, questions, questions. Yeah, uh, there were a few questions of a general kind. Uh, one was the Jews of Urbino, were they Sephardic or not? Sorry, sorry. can you repeat? The, Jews, Ju the Jews of Urbino. Ah, were, Urbino. Hmm? Yes. Were they Sephardic? They were. They were uh, well. They were the two. The two uh, communities of Urbino and Pesaro were interconnected. There were Sephardic Jews in Urbino. However, uh, many of them uh, left uh, in the 17th century. And uh, what happened that uh, Urbino became a concentration of Jews of other parts of the Marche region because of the expulsion, <clears throat> because of the expulsion of uh, 1626 from Northern Marche. So uh, from 1626, let's say the community of Urbino was uh, uh, overwhelmingly Italian. Uh, before the, the, the 17th century, however, yes, there were Sephardic Jews brought by the ruling family to Urbino, but uh, even more so in Pesaro, because they wanted to, they wanted to open a, a port which would uh, uh, enter into competition with the port of Ancona. And especially, uh, you, know, you know the story of Dona Gracia Mendes, uh, yes. and that she, you know, many of you are familiar with that. So they tried to boycott the port of Ancona and to uh, use the, so for the Sephardic Jews to use the port of Pesaro instead. Uh, it didn't work out as they, they wish, and, uh, but the, the Duke of Urbino was quite, uh, unfortunately, he was weak. So in time he had to, let's say, um, accept uh, the, the will of the Pope. And that's why so many uh, Portuguese uh, and Sephardic Jews left, uh, left Pesaro and Urbino at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, how about archives? Are there any digitized archives available in Italy? More and more, uh, they, they digitalized the archives of Livorno. For instance, now there are on the, on the internet, you can find uh, the uh, lists of uh, of, uh, of uh, people arriving in Livorno, leaving Livorno, or li leaving Livorno. So I, 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 <coughs> I consulted it myself. Uh, of course, uh, um, it is digitalized, but sometimes not very easy to see what is the name or the surname, but it's mm -hmm. indeed uh, a resource. Uh, and then um, I understand that there are other initiatives in other, in other parts. Um, I show you the books. But I, I believe that uh, it will be more and more, more and more. So the one who springs to my mind is the one in Livorno. In uh, uh, the community of Ancona, it was uh, every, all the material, everything was sent to Israel at the University of Jerusalem. And uh, I think they are uh, digitalizing it as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Sorry, can I jump in with a question? Because yes. we, we frequently hear from, or not frequently, but we sometimes hear from people in. Um, southern Italy and uh, Sicily, 
who believe that they have uh, distant Sephardic ancestry. Um, do you have any thoughts on that or? Yes, uh, the answer is mainly no. I will explain you why, because you know, everyone thinks that the, the expulsion of 1492 in Spain was, uh, uh, <laughs> was very bad and so on. But the one, from it, the one from South Italy was even worse because in Spain, you could convert to Christianity and remain. In Italy, they expelled uh, the, the first expulsion from uh, um, the were of course, the expulsion of Sicily and then also from south of Italy. But what they did is that they, they also, ex, uh, they, after the first expulsion in south Italy, seven years later, they ex, there was a second expulsion of all the converts because they said that it was impossible to determine whether these converts were living Christian lives or Jewish lives. So not only all the Jews were expelled from South Italy, but also the new Christians were all expelled, which didn't happen in Spain. So, um, you know, it's, it becomes then difficult to, th this is why it's more, it's more uh, unlikely that uh, they have Jewish ancestors. Of course, I mean, if you are talking about ancestors which converted into 11th, 12th century, okay, I don't know, maybe, yes, perhaps, but, uh, uh, the last expulsion, which was the final one, uh, left no, not even any convert in South Italy. No, that's the answer we expected. <laughs> but we okay. get asked, so. Yeah. Um, what about the Inquisition? That every nation state in Italy has had its own Inquisition, or was there a general one? Uh, what was the papal inquisition? Inquisition was it kind of uh, covering the whole of Italy or only the papal state? There was inquisition. I mean, the Pope was nominating some usual inquisitors also in the different uh, in the different uh, states, but of course their power were very much constrained by the local local ruler. It was nothing like in Spain. We only the only they say we had very few cases of. Uh, Jews being burned at stake or converts being burned at stake. The 24 in Ancona, uh, three of them in, uh, in Rome, which were extradited from Ferrara, uh, also at the end of the 16th century. So there was the Inquisition, but it was nothing like uh, the, one in, uh, the one in Spain. And you had different inquisitor in different parts of, uh, of Italy. It was a very, let's say, it was a very mild one compared to what we saw in Spain mm. and Portugal or Latin America later on. And then there were a lot of, lot of questions about uh, individual surnames. Um, would you be able to answer those questions through email or through uh, Facebook? My, yes, I will try to. This is my email. Can you see it? No, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> it's, it's Luca. <laughs> It's Luca.ascoli. Luca. Luca.ascoli. Ascoli. At EC. <laughs> dot Europa. Dot EU. So it's, I repeat, Luca.ascoli. At EC. Dot Europa. Dot EU. Um. Okay. I would also, well, I want also to show something. I mean, many people, you know, they're interested in this place or that place, small place and so on. There is a whole wealth of information here. So it's www, sorry, www.tau.ac.il. It's called, it's a pro, it's a, let's say, it's a website called Italia Judaica, Jewish Italy. And you find basically a wealth of information about hundreds and hundreds of places in Italy about how the Jewish community developed. There are also many names uh, there, especially, it, it, is, it is particularly interesting for uh, small, uh, small communities. And uh, you find a lot of information there about Jewish Italy. Okay. So we will not be going into individual surnames at this point. You can put your questions to Luke, 
acá, subes email o Facebook. And uh, I think it's uh, time to wrap it up. Okay. Um, can I just invite Gina uh, to, uh, to say something? Thank you. Um, I just thought I wanted to take this opportunity to publicly thank Luca for all the help he's given me probably over the last 15 years. He's been a very dedicated helper to me, looking for my, at my own Ascoli family. And he knew that I wanted to connect my two great grandmothers, Ascoli grandmothers to the tree in Italy before I leave this earth. And he's been doing all he could all the time. I can't tell you how much assistance he's given me over the years. And he just recently, with the help of two of the books that he's shown, the Livorno book, the new Livorno book, and the book about the Jews of Massa and Carrara, he's just, in the last few weeks, managed to connect my family up to a tree that goes back to the mid-1500s. And I just could not be more grateful. And I just wanted to thank you publicly, Luca, for all the assistance. Thank you, sorry Gina. If I, sorry if I've been a pain over the years. No, no. It was a pleasure, Gina. It was quite interesting, actually. <laughs> thank you very much. And thanks for another very interesting talk. A pleasure. Thank you. No, thank you. That, that was a, a complete tour de force. It was... Um, I'm going to have to sort of watch it several times to 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 absorb everything. That was absolutely mm -hmm. um, fascinating. Um, Ton, would you like to um, to wind up as um, yeah? yeah. Um. If uh, no, the screen sharing is uh, not working anymore. Okay, let me just see if I can. I'm I'm on. Um... That's okay. no, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I don't know. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I'm 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 not on my my regular computer because um, because we have problems. Um, uh, so I. Is, um, okay. So <clears throat> next week we have a talk about the Jews of Libya. David, do we know who the, who the talker is? Um, I, I think we 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 have several. Um, I'm afraid, as as I said, my mm. computer's died, so I don't have the information to hand. But um, okay. it's absolutely but fascinating subject. Yeah, it will be great. And we would love to see you there again. Um, Sephardic World brings these uh, meetings to you. And we do this on a shoestring budget. So we are always grateful to our patrons to make our work possible. And if you want to, you can become a patron as well. And we provide a genealogical research service. You can approach us with your gene genealogical questions and we will uh, try to provide answers. And thank you for watching everybody and supporting us. And uh, a big thank you to Luca who did a great job tonight. Yeah, I, I, I apologize that we, we, we had some technical issues. I'm afraid um, I'm going to have to say a refuer shlama for my, um, my laptop. I'm afraid it's uh, reaching the end of its, its days. We will uh, post um, a, a recording of the talk as, as quickly as possible, um, first of all, to the Patreon site and, 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 and later on, um, on Facebook or YouTube. So um, I'm not sure if I can unmute everybody from this machine. Let me just try. Um, yes, yes, I can. So um, we'd like to thank Luca again for absolutely stellar talk. And thank you to everybody who 
joined us and we um, hope to see everybody next week. So um, have a good uh, have a good evening or afternoon, depending where you where you are. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye -bye. Thank you Luca. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Mil gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Alan. Hi. Hi. It's very interesting. Thank you. Hi, Gigi. Nice to see you. Okay. Thank, thank see you, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.